What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the Wright State University Veteran Voices Project. I am Navy Veteran and Content Manager Jeremy Tack. On behalf of the Veteran Voices Project, we'd like to thank you for watching this interview and to let you know that the best way to support us and especially the veterans featured on this channel is to hit that subscribe button. So go ahead, feel free to smash that subscribe button. Please hit that like button and go ahead and comment and share. Again, thank you for watching this important story. Hope you enjoy. Recording the interview of Cassie Barlow. This interview is being conducted by Erica Carter from the Wright State University Veterans Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at Wright State University in the New Media Incubator. It is 9.49 a.m. on January 25, 2019. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Buffalo, New York in um, December, on December 10th of 1965. Who were your parents and what were their occupations? My parents were Wilma Rizzo, um, that was my mom, and my dad was Vince Rizzo, and they were both teachers in the uh, public schools and then um, in the private school as well. Later on in my mom's career, she went to uh, parochial schools. Okay, so education is really yes. important. Yes. Okay. And did she teach, did they teach primary grades or middle or college? Yeah, um, primary grades, um, mostly. Okay. Do you have yeah. any siblings? I do. I have an older sister, uh, Anne, and I have a younger brother, Vincent, and uh, so I'm a, I'm a middle child. Did either of them serve in the military? Uh, my sister did. So my sister went through ROTC. She was two years before me. Um, in school, and so we were in the same ROTC detachment, and um, and she ended up getting out of active duty and went into the reserves. Okay. Did that help spark your interest for ROTC? Yeah, it definitely did. Um, with my two, with my parents both being teachers, um, you know, we grew up in a you know a, in a middle class. Um, uh, environment where my parents didn't have a lot of money to send us to college and so you know we were on our own to kind of go off and look for scholarships and I found the ROTC scholarship and I thought what a great opportunity to go to school and um, to serve for a few years and, and really that's all I imagined I was going to do. I was going to serve for just four years and then I was going to get out and I was going to you know solve world hunger or something and um, I, um, I joined, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I really enjoyed the environment, I really enjoyed the culture in ROTC, um, and really serving the bigger mission, and I think that's what led me to want to stay around uh, after my first four years. Okay, so I just wanna clarify, um, when, is ROTC then what it's like now? Did you join in high school? Because you, you know, they have the JROTC and some ROTC programs, mm -hmm. or is that what you did when you joined a college? Can you just specify for the sure. timeline? Sure. So yeah, so I, I didn't have the opportunity to do junior ROTC, so I just did ROTC for college. I earned a four-year scholarship and went to um, Georgetown University on a ROTC scholarship. Is Georgetown the first college that you went to? Yes. Or you, okay. Yes. Um, so which branch did you go into? I went into the Air Force, and um, it, it wasn't because I wanted to fly. I really didn't have an interest in flying. 
Uh, I had just done some research on um, really the acceptance of women uh, in the different services at that time because it was the late 80s. And I found, based on my research, I found that the Air Force was going to be the right place for me. Uh, and I knew I didn't want to be on a ship. <laughs> so that's, um, that's why the Air Force was, was my choice. Did your sister also join the Air Force? She did. Okay. She did. That's, that's exciting. What was it like being in ROTC with her? It was fun. I mean, it was always, you know, my, you know, my sister was always someone over the years that I kind of looked up to. Obviously, she was two years older than me, and, and um, so as a kid, you know, you're always looking up to the, the older kids, like, wow, I want to be like that someday, you know. And so it was really fun to, to do ROTC together and to go to college together. So we were at Georgetown together, and we roomed together for two years, um, which was kind of fun. And um, it was just always nice knowing that I had someone to go to that was you know, more senior than me from an ROTC perspective to kind of tell me what it was going to be like. Because like I said, I had no idea what I was getting into. So it was nice to have somebody like that that I could say, what is, how do we do this? And why do we do this? And what's this for? And, and to have those types of conversations was well, really good. When you were in high school, did you have any um, extracurricular activities that you enjoyed or wanted to do or I understand that you said I need college money I'm gonna do this yes but you said you wanted to save world hunger yeah, How, <laughs> yeah. what was that right about? so I did I was very I was a very active high school student in um, extracurricular sports basically so I um, I did cross country I did volleyball I did basketball and then I did track as well um, so I was pretty much all year round in some kind of athletic endeavor. Um, and then during the summer, I played on, on different teams as well, um, diff, you know, basketball teams. And, and, um, and I did a lot of track, um, track meets over the summer. So there was a, a choice at one point um, as I was looking at colleges, you know, do I want to do an athletic scholarship? Um, and I had several colleges um, asking me questions about playing basketball for them and then track as well. And I ended up um, being an intercollegiate athlete at uh, Georgetown, not on a scholarship, but um, in, the, on tra in track. So I did both indoor track and outdoor track and um, just loved being able to be an intercollegiate athlete in Division I and compete at that level but not have the pressure of a scholarship. Um, and I was in field events, um, so I threw the javelin and the discus and the hammer and the shot put. And, and um, so doing, having practice was kind of, um, you know, on my own um, and lifting on my own and then, you know, finding time to meet with my coach for, you know, skills work. And, um, but so I, I got a little bit of got a little bit of both sides at Georgetown. I got to you know be a be an athlete, as well as do ROTC, and then of course all my studies as well. So you were pretty busy. So it was really busy, but you know that I, I guess I learned early in life that that's the way that my brain works, and that's what I like to do, and I like to be doing a lot of different things at the same time, and I get bored very quickly with just one thing. So. Um, Looking back on my life now and looking at what I did in college, um, the fact that I was in all of those things isn't surprising. I mean, if you look at my life today, um, it's very, very similar, actually. Um, and I think that's just because that's my personality and that's kind of the way my brain works. Okay, wow. Um, now, when you uh, went to ROTC, for clarification, because mm -hmm. civilians also watch this also, right. did that mean you were going to be an officer or enlisted or did you have a choice? Yeah, so through the um, Air Force ROTC program, that meant that I was going to be an, um, a commissioned officer. So when I finished the program, um, I went right in as the second lieutenant uh, in the United States Air Force. Okay. So, Did you still have to go to like a basic training or was ROTC served as that? Yeah, so ROTC was, in general, the, the training program, the equivalent of what, you know, officer training school or, um, you know, the, the Air Force Academy, what they do there for four years, you know, the, the training that we did was equivalent to that. We still had a, um, what's, what was called a summer, um, it was a summer camp that we went to. <laughs> Wasn't, that's not really a, a good name for it, but it was basically our equivalent of basic training. And tell me about <coughs> that. Um, 
once again, no idea what I was getting into. Great to have my sister who had done that two years before me. Um, we actually went to the exact same. Back then there were a bunch of um, locations across the country that you can go to and um, ours just happened to be Plattsburgh Air Force Base in upstate New York. And just a beautiful base, which has since closed, um, but very historic and just beautiful. Um, so I think it was a four-week camp where you go, you do a lot of physical fitness, you take classes on leadership, um, classes, of course, on you know, drill and ceremony, you know, and marching and all that fun stuff that you typically do as a, as a trainee and as a, as a cadet. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, went into it not really sure what to expect. My sister gave me a few clues on, on how to prepare and, and um, I, uh, at the end of the camp, I ended up being the top cadet and, and I'll be honest, I really, I, I have no idea how that happened other than I just did my best throughout the camp and um, I was a psychology major at the time at Georgetown, or no, I take that back. I was a math major at the time at Georgetown. And I chose math because um, there were only a certain number of majors that you could choose as a cadet. So I chose math, knowing that I liked math, but it wasn't a, um, you know, it wasn't something that I was super excited about. Um, so when I finished as the top cadet, the um, officer in charge of the camp, you know, called me in and congratulated me and said, okay, this is the point at which I offer you your pilot slot um, because that's what we do with our top cadet. And so you have a guaranteed pilot slot. And I looked him in the eye and I said, I don't want a pilot slot. <laughs> and, and he looked at me like he almost fell out of his chair because I probably was the first one that ever said that to him. And he said, are you kidding me? And I said, no, I'm being totally serious. I don't want a pilot slot. And he said, okay, well, tell me what you want then, because, you know, we, we, you know, get to offer you something that you want out of this experience and then for doing so well. And I said, I just want to change my major. That's all I want to do. And he said, okay. He said, what do you want to change your major to? And I said, psychology. Um, I had been taking some classes in psychology and, and knew that I, I really enjoyed the classes and that's what I wanted to do. And he said, okay. He said, but we can do that on top of a pilot slot. <laughs> and I said, it's okay. I really don't want a pilot slot. So anyway, that kind of started me down the path of going into psychology and where I ended up down the road with a, with a master's degree and a PhD in psychology. Um, and just really loving um, workforce development and working with people. Okay. And I know I jumped ahead a lot there. But. No, we're, <laughs> gonna, we're still going to cover all of that. Uh, I, my question to you is, um, why not fly? And you didn't want to be on a ship, so I know I have motion sickness. Yeah. So it's like long car rides and I'm out. Right. But why, why didn't you want to fly? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, and if a pilot is listening, uh, they'll, they'll probably be shocked. But I, I just wanted more than that. I wanted more than being in a, you know, being stuck in a cockpit. Um, and, um, you know, I wanted to be involved in really big strategic things in, in the Air Force, for the Air Force. And I think I was able to do that a at a very young age that many pilots weren't able to do at very at young the young age that I was um, and I wanted to um, I wanted to supervise people and I wanted to work with a lot of people and I knew that being a pilot you you know kind of for quite some time are just in charge of yourself um, and then you eventually get to be in leadership positions but it's much further down the road than you know than being in a in a support career field, which is where I was, um, so that's really why I I it was because of what I wanted to be and where I wanted to go, um, and I knew I wanted to get a PhD as well, and I knew that if I stepped into the cockpit, that that would keep me from doing that for a while. So you know, some people just have an intense desire to fly, and that's wonderful that they do. Um, and I, you know, applaud them for doing that. And I just didn't have that intense desire. Um, and that was another part of it. I thought, why am I going to take somebody's chance who really, really wants to be in a cockpit when I could really care less? It's not, it's not where I wanted to be. 
Um, so as a result, I just was able to choose something else and, and was very happy about that. Um, it seems like, how old were you um, at this time? I was, let's see, 21 maybe, 20. Now you really knew who you were and what you wanted to be at 20. And I had an idea, but I, I was not yeah. for sure on that path. Is there something in maybe your training or mm -hmm. uh, growing up that, that made you just know? I think you have a recipe for success and I'm trying to get, I, wa I yeah. want people to hear it, or is it just who you are? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think I discovered over time, and, and at, the, at the time, you know, I thought I knew what I wanted to do, um, and that was to, you know, walk down the psychology path. Um, I would say that I did that, but I kind of morphed what the psychology path looked like over time. I knew in general that I, I loved um, people, I loved the human mind, and I loved trying to figure out what was in the human mind, how the human mind worked. Um, so I eventually got there on that pathway, but I, I will tell you that I, when I took my first psychology class at Georgetown University, I, I really just, I fell in love. I couldn't get enough. Um, you know, I was a student that was going home at, at night and, you know, finding more books to read. And um, so I just, it, it was that um, study that I did while I was in college that really helped me to discern what I wanted to do in the future. And I, you know, looking back once again, I think it speaks to the value of higher education, right? Whether that's a two-year degree or a certification or a four-year degree or more, you know, that time is, is meant to help students, I believe, really discern where they want to be and what they want to do. Because you, I think m many people have an inkling of what they want to do. Um, but it's not until they really dig into the books and really do the hard work um, and the due diligence to, to figure out, okay, not only do I like this, but I'm good at it and I want to continue. Um, so it's just a good way to discern, I think, you know, educating yourself is a good way to discern what's, what's right for you. All right, wonderful. All right, so you um, dropped your NCA, or sorry, your commander's jaw with the I don't want to be a pilot thing right and I want to I want to go back to school what happens next so I go back to school with my new major and and just really a new attitude that wow um, I'm super excited that I get to kind of follow the the pathway that um, that I want to be on and so continued to take psychology classes um, continued to kind of fall in love with the subject and, um, and then continue to step into more leadership roles through ROTC. So I ended up being the cadet wing commander my senior year and really had a ball with that and, and had never, other than being like, I have been captains of sports teams and such, and, but never really had been in a leadership role like that before. So getting to lead my peers and um, the, the students that were coming up through the um, the different universities, and we had a consortium of universities, so it wasn't just Georgetown students. Our ROTC detachment was at Howard University, um, Detachment 130, and we, um, we were a consortium of universities from D.C., so we had George, Georgetown students, we had George Washington students, um, we had American University students, Catholic University students, University of District Columbia, I mean, we had, we had just this wide um, range of students from all over D.C., which made it more exciting because you got to meet students from other colleges, and it wasn't just all about Georgetown students. So just being in that, I, I, I learned, that was my first real taste at leadership, and I learned that I just loved it. Uh, I loved, um, you know, helping other people try to achieve their goals and helping other people get better um, through leading the organization and helping the organization get better. So um, that's when I had my first taste, so to say, uh, at, le at leadership. And then it was came time to um, select a career field and to graduate and to move on. And I remember going to our um, NCO in the department because once again, 
you know, I had no idea what any of these um, occupational areas were that, that we had to choose from. So I remember sitting with her, she was a tech sergeant, and I sat with her and, and um, she walked through um, all of my options with my major, you know, one by one by one, like here's what you would do in this job, and here's what you would do in this job, and here's what, and, and she, I mean, I look back at that and, and um, just give her a lot of credit for, I mean, that wasn't her job. I mean, she was our administrator for our detachment. But she took the time to sit down with me and help me discern what are these different occupational areas and, um, you know, what do you think I would be good at and what do you think I would like. And, and she knew me well enough from just working with me in the de detachment for a while to, to help me. And so um, through conversation with her, ended up choosing a career field, information management, and back then, which which is now morphed into a communications um, career field in the Air Force, so it helped me choose my um, my first step in the Air Force, and it was a great first step. It was a great first um, area, um, occupational area for me to be in, and an, another way to, you know. So I went off to my first base from that point um, to Mather Air Force Base in Northern California. And, um, you know, being a kid from upstate New York, when it came time to choose where to go for my assignment, um, I, of course, chose all these bases in the Northeast. And the Air Force knows better. Um, and the Air Force knows now, and of course I know this now too, but, you know, it doesn't make sense to send somebody home because th they know, already know their home and there's more of a likelihood of them, after their first four years, getting out and just staying there and being at home. So. They couldn't have sent me much further in the continental United States other than Northern California um, and to Sacramento. And, and I ended up absolutely loving the job. I'm a brand new, you know, 22-year-old second lieutenant. And I walk into base information management and I'm in charge of 15 people. And um, 15 people who are all older than me. And, um, and I was immediately humbled by all of their experience and all of their time of service. And luckily, I had a um, master sergeant um, who I will s still remember to this day, who took me under his wing. And, and um, I'm so thankful to him um, to this day because he taught me the ropes. And, um, you know, I told him from day one, I said, look, I said, I don't know anything about this organization. Um, you know, I'm coming to you brand new, and I said, I, I'm hoping that we all swim together because that's what I want to do. I don't want to sink. <laughs> so let's, let's all swim together, and, um, and I'm going to rely a lot on you. And I, th I think he was happy to hear that. I, I hope he was happy to hear that because he literally latched onto me and then led, led me um, through that first leadership experience. And it was just, I mean, I have many fond memories um, of the people in that organization um, that were part of the team. And uh, I'm actually in, still in touch with several of them and it mourned them when some of them have pa since passed and we've all mourned them together because it was a, it was a really tight team, um, that, that organization. So that was a really that was a really great first experience, and and when I, um, you know, going back to the doing multiple different things. So I'm I'm in charge of base information management, but um, I also wanted to. I knew that I wanted to get a master's degree in in clinical psychology. So as soon as I showed up in California, I went to the education office and figured out how am I going to do this. Started taking classes at night, and I was single, so got home from work went to class, and that was my life for two years. And I loved it because I was learning more about what I, the topic and the subject that I loved, and um, you know, getting to build myself as a leader because I was studying clinical psychology. Um, and at the same time, I was on base for maybe a week, and these two very large, um, tall, imposing young, young uh, men um, who one was a staff sergeant, one was a tech sergeant, walked into base information management one day and went to the front desk and said, we're looking for Lieutenant Rizzo. And that was me, it was my maiden name. And, and I'm like, I, I'm, I heard them and I kind of like peeked out and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, am I in trouble? Why are they, what are they here for? 
And it turned out that they had, um, <laughs> they had really good intel, um, and they were watching all of, the, all of the women that had PCS'd into the base for the base basketball team. So um, they came in and talked to me and said, hey, do you want to play? You know, we've got a pretty good team. Here's what we do. Here's when we practice. Here's the tournaments we go to. And, you know, needless to say, I'm in. I love basketball. I'm in. So I ended up playing on the base basketball team, too, which was a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun stories there as well from, um, you know, I was the only officer on the team. So, um, you know, once again, lots of great NCO uh, mentorship um, through basketball. Who would have known, right? But I learned a lot of lessons um, from those ladies, and some of those ladies I'm still in contact with, you know, almost 30 years later. Um, so just, you know, that was just a great, um, great assignment. And then I ended up meeting my husband in that assignment as well. Um, he was another lieutenant on the base, and we met and ended up getting married a few years down the road. So just, just very fond memories of, of that first that first base. Okay, um, so I have two questions. The first one is, can you just tell me what an average work day was then? You say information. Yeah. And so just tell us what, what that meant. Yeah, if so back in the day, um, there was one file location on the base, and that was base <laughs> information management. There was one copy shop, basically. Rep we called it reprographics back then. One place where you could make copies, that was base information management. Um, one place that was in charge of all the publications on the base, that was base information management. So we had a lot of traffic. Th we, we basically were a service, customer service organization um, <clears throat> with different groups of people doing all that work that I just mentioned. Um, so I, you know, I was in charge of leading that operation, so making sure that everything was going smoothly, making sure that, um, you know, we were following rules and regulations, um, you know, per the Air Force, how, how that operation was supposed to be run, and just in general taking care of people, um, you know, making sure that they had what they needed to do their jobs. Um, so I learned very early um, in, in that first job um, that if you take care of people, you don't have to worry about the mission. The mission just happens. It, it, um, the mission is accomplished because people have what they need, they know that, that you care about them, and they, they do what they're supposed to do, and, and, and they actually jump over any bar that you set because they want to do good things for the organization and for the leader of the organization because they know that, that you care about them, and not just about them, but about their families and about their situations. That is an amazing life lesson. It really is. It, it really was. And it's great you <coughs> got that at, you know, 22, maybe? Right. Um, so you mentioned your husband. Mm -hmm. What did he do? So my husband, so Mayfair Air Force Base was the navigator training base um, if for the entire United States Air Force. Um, and my husband had just gone through um, navigator training, had just uh, graduated, and was waiting for his next assignment. So he was working in an office um, in the headquarters building, just doing, doing work as he waited. Um, he was assigned to an office. And I ended up being assigned to that office on a special project. Um, within my first few weeks uh, at the base, <coughs> I um, was assigned to do a security investigation. Someone had accidentally mailed a secret document through the Post. Through the inner, yeah, whoops is right, through the inner office mail. And uh, so it was my job <laughs> to do some, um, do an investigation and find out what happened, why it happened, and if any of that document was, um, was exposed to someone that it shouldn't have been. So that was a great learning experience <laughs> for me <laughs> because um, I, had, I got to meet a whole bunch of people as I went around and did interviews. And he was in the office that, um, the, the person, the security office, basically, that was leading the investigation. So <clears throat> just through conversations and ch through being in the office, we met each other, we started talking, we went out on a few dates, and just really hit it off. Um, really, um, you know, became good friends, and then uh, over time uh, realized that we, we wanted to spend our lives together. And um, 
We just celebrated number 27. Congratulations. Thank you. So um, just, and, you know, and I, I look back on, um, you know, my time in the Air Force, too, and say, boy, I, I wouldn't have met my husband if it wasn't for being in the Air Force. So I was, I was meant to be, uh, I was meant to be in the Air Force, and um, I was meant to be at Mather Air Force Base um, as my first assignment. All right, so your assignments in the Air Force are two years? Typically, that first one was the longest one. It was four years. Oh, my. Um, which is long um, nowadays. Um, <clears throat> but it was, I think it was because the base was getting ready to close, so they didn't want to bring new people in for just a really short period of time. So many of us who were there um, just stayed so we could close the base, basi basically. And it was just a really interesting experience um, to have as a brand new lieutenant, once again, because um, I was thrown right into just a really very political situation with base closure and with the relationships with the community. And because when I was there, I ended up going from base information management to being the executive officer at the wing level. So got to work directly for the wing commander and um, got to see, you know, how the base operates. Um, and it was a flying training mission, as I mentioned. So how does that work? Um, and got, a, you know, some amazing life lessons from working um, for the wing commander as well at a very young age um, to see how, how the wing and how, the, how a base operates and how they um, work with the community. Um, and it was a, it was a, it was interesting to see the the base closure operation as well, how that how that worked. Okay, um, so the base closes and you get assigned, and is is your husband assigned also or? Yeah, so it, um, that's when the that's when the fun started because um, I had applied for a um, PhD program for the Air Force to send me to get a PhD in industrial organizational psychology. And I, I, so I got the scholarship and then the Air Force said, okay, start your applications wherever you wanna go. And, and um, so my husband already had an assignment to Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. So I started to look around Randolph to look where are the, ba where are the, the universities that I could go. And the closest one I found was three hours away in Houston, Texas, Rice University. And um, I applied to Rice and they accepted me. And so we ended up spending three years where I was in Houston and he was in San Antonio. And luckily we were close enough. I mean, three hours isn't that big of a deal, especially on I-10. So <clears throat> on weekends, we spent a lot of time going back and forth. And um, that worked for three years because we knew, you know, we were doing it for a limited amount of time. And, you know, there was a goal at the end, that, you know, I was going to have a PhD and then we were going to walk off into the sunset together, right? Um, didn't quite work that way because I finished the PhD and it was time for another assignment. And they said, okay, Cassie, here's all the places you can go. And Tim, here's all the places you can go. And they, none of them matched. <laughs> Not a one of them matched. So we kind of had to come to Jesus together and we looked at each other and, and it, it was a tough decision, but we sat down and we said, okay, what are we gonna do? Because, you know, obviously we wanna be married, we wanna start a family. How are we gonna do this? And um, Tim said, look, he said, uh, you, you have a commitment, you have a real, real big future, I think, um, in the Air Force. And he said, I've, I, um, you know, I've loved what I, I love what I do, I love flying, but he said, navigators are, are going away. I mean, <laughs> GPS has taken over our, our job. Um, so the, the jobs are diminishing. Um, so he said, it's time for me to do something else. And then that, you know, that led to a conversation, well, what is something else? What do you want to do? And it, I mean, it literally, it was, you know, pull out the old book, what color is your parachute, right? To figure out what is it that you want to do? And so we had a, that conversation next. And he said, well, you know what? He said, all I've ever wanted to do is fly. So I don't know what I want to do. So he, he really dug deep um, and, and did some research and, and figured out what is it that I want to do and decided to go to law school. Um, so at, for our next assignment, which was Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, he um, decided that he was going to go to law school. So he went to University of Dayton Law School and um, got a law degree 
and um, specific uh, patent, uh, he became a patent attorney. Um, so he, um, he, he found a new love um, in patent work, really, really enjoys, and he has a scientific background, which is required, so really enjoyed the, the, um, th that opportunity to go to law school and then was able to, from that point, either have his own um, business where he had customers, clients who needed patent work, or to work for um, patent agents or agencies in the different areas, um, you know, where we were assigned. And um, something else really good happened at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base the first time. Um, my daughter was born uh, on the 20th of February, 97. And um, th that was just a real blessing. Um, Emma w has been a real blessing in our lives. Um, and so, you know, when we came back to Wright-Patterson again the second time, um, we were able to bring her back to her home, really, which is where she was born. So, and my husband is actually from the Dayton area. So, um, you know, being able to have his, his daughter born here and then be able to come back a second time was just a real, real blessing for all of us. Okay, and then probably his family lives here, so, yes. you know, in-laws could be with the new grandbaby yes. and is how, you know, then babysitting and stuff. So Absolutely. That, that had to work out really well. I feel like we missed a few steps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We, <laughs> we, so you, you guys uh, decide he gets out, mm -hmm. um, pursues law. Where do you go? So this will be in, I have another just question for clarity. Um, when you went to PhD school, mm -hmm. were you still serving or your only focus was PhD? Yeah, so I'm, I'm in the Air Force at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm a captain in the Air Force and my job is to go to school full time. Okay. Sweet job. Yeah. Really sweet job. And I had to pinch myself every day. Um, my job is to go to class. My job is to come home. My job is to do my homework. My job is to write my papers. And the Air Force, you know, only gives you three years to do that. So you're on a super quick timeline um, to get a PhD done. But luckily, Rice University was just fantastic from day one and said, you know, we will help you. Um, you tell us what you need. And um, so much so, just to give you an example, that um, there was one class that I had that wasn't going to, that I needed, that wasn't going to be offered until after I left. So I talked with my advisor and I said, I really need this class. And he said, you know what, let's do it, me and you, let's do it. So we met in his office every week for that class, just me and him. And it was just fantastic that he was willing to do that for me and so that I could finish on time. And, and mind you, that class was tough because I had to read every article, I had to be ready to discuss everything because I was the only one there. Um, but you know what, it was, it was really good. And I still remember what that class was, you know, many years later because, um, because he took the time um, and, and interest in what I wanted to do and wanted to help me succeed. Um, so yeah, so I go to Rice University, Tim goes to Randolph Air Force Base and is an instructor for navigators, um, which he absolutely loved. Um, and I think ties back to something that he is interested in doing now in retirement, um, and that is to teach. So, um, but yeah, so we're, we're apart for those three years, and then we get assigned, you know, after I finish the PhD, we get assigned to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, to the Air Force Research Laboratory. And um, I'm assigned there as a behavioral scientist, and I get to lead an acquisition program um, and um, had some really good experiences there as well from learning how the acquisition system works, um, learning how to be a program manager and a scientist at the same time. Uh, so it was just, it was fun. It was a fun assignment and of course learning how to be a new mom. Um, so there really couldn't have been a better place to be than the Air Force Research Lab at the time. And um, you know, once again, a very, um, male-dominated um, uh, Air Force at the time. Um, and I'll never forget that, you know, I was, you know, I was working throughout my entire pregnancy and I was getting close to the end of, you know, when I was supposed to deliver. And I was actually two weeks late, so 
I, I was at work, you know, you know, on my due date, I'm at work, and my, after my due date, I'm still at work, and I'll never forget, um, I had a hallway, um, I worked at the end of a hallway, and the entire hallway was a bunch of offices and all guys, and, and, and one day they walked down the hallway, um, and they all kind of congregated in my office, and I was like, hey guys, what's up? And they said, well, we, we just wanted to talk to you about something, and I was like, okay, what are we going to talk about? And they said, well, you know, we want to understand what our role is, you know, when you go into labor. And I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. And, um, and I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, what should we do? And I just thought it was the funniest question. And I said, well, and, and part of me, I'm not, I'm not usually this snarky, but part of me was like, this is, this is a good opportunity to be, to have a little fun. So I said, <clears throat> and I started, I just pointed at him and I said, you go boil the water, you go get the towels, you, and I like gave them all jobs and they're, and I was being serious, like didn't crack a smile. And they're all looking at me like, I mean, this, with this surprised look on their face, like, you've got to be kidding me. Okay, we want you to go home right now, right? <laughs> and then of course I broke a smile and started laughing. I was like, I'm just kidding. I said, I'm going to go home unless I have to go right to the hospital. But don't worry, I'm going to call my husband if I need help getting anywhere. And if, you know, if he can't get here, you know, I'll, I'll ask one of you guys to help me get to wherever I need to go if I need it. But I said, don't worry about it. You know, you guys, it, it'll be okay, you know. And it was just really funny. I mean, it, and, you know, at the same time, really nice that, that they all got together and that they cared that much about me to ask, you know, what do you want us to do? How can we help, you know? Um, so that was kind of, you know, I kind of felt like the, you know, the sister at that point, you know. <laughs> they just wanted to help me. That's delightful. That really is delightful. Mm -hmm. So your daughter's born, you uh, you take your maternity leave, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what happens? Yeah, so we, um, let's see, we were at Bright Pat until, um, 1999, and um, at that point, you know, I get another assignment, and my daughter is two at the time, and um, you know, first time moving, of course, with a new baby, and um, so we're moving to Colorado Springs. We get an assignment to the Air Force Academy, and um, which we were just ex really excited about because great place to be. Um, and, you know, but, but the biggest concern as a new mom for me was, what about my daughter? You know, she's in this fantastic, she actually was at Mini University here at Wright State. Um, she was in a fantastic daycare. How do I find one exactly like that, right? So um, I go to the head of Mini University and I say, hey, I need your help. Here, what am I looking for? So she gave me all these guidelines, you know, here's what you're looking for you know, and, and really helped a lot. So I was able to dive into, you know, what's available in the Colorado Springs area. I was able to find a, a daycare, you know, get my daughter signed up. And, you know, that was absolutely, I could not think about anything else until I had that done. Um, so finished that and then started to, you know, the psychologist in me was, you know, how am I going to help her transition? You know, she's two, but I've got to, I've got to help, you know, I've got to make sure I'm doing everything right as a parent. And so I looked it up, of course, did the research, and, and um, they said, one of the things they said is, you know, go visit if you can, go visit the new location and do a tour with, with her, and then take some pictures um, and do a little, like, um, photo album, take some pictures of her old friends from her previous um, school and her teachers and everything, and then take some pictures of the new one. And so I did that. I made this little photo album, and we still have that little photo, photo album to this day. Um, and then, and and you know, gave it to her and put it in places where she would reg she could regularly like flip through and see her friends. And um, and I, you know, I don't know if that helped or not, but for the transition went very well. Um, and um, I joined the um, institutional research section um, office at the Air Force Academy. Um, my husband ended up finding a law firm in town that he could work with, and um, it was an attorney who really, uh, we still talk with today, who really took Tim under his wing because he's a brand new patent attorney, right? A lot to learn. 
Um, so he took Tim under his wing and really helped him learn how to be a good patent attorney. And Tim still talks to him to this day. Um, and then I'm assigned to institutional research, which is basically the organization that, that does all of the all of the research projects, basically, um, around the institution um, at the Air Force Academy. And I'm there for about um, a year. I'm about in that job for about a year when the speechwriter job for the superintendent um, comes available. And um, it just sounded really interesting to me, so I applied, um, and I got the job. And it was really interesting to me because it was really interesting. It was a great job because it was, um, you know, you basically um, prepare the superintendent, the three-star general, for all of his engagements, all of his speeches, um, which he did a lot. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I got to really know him and know his style and then try to build in, you know, that style um, as, you know, for all of his speeches. So it, it, he sounded um, like him, and he didn't sound like somebody else. Um, so that was a that was a fun um, that was a really fun job too. And, and while I was there, <laughs> I got to um, I got to teach in the behavioral sciences department, which I absolutely loved. It was just a really fun experience. Um, so kind of my first step into the college classroom. And um, you know, recognizing that I really, I really loved that, and that you know, that might be something I wanted to do down the road. Um, so, and then I, of course, on the sports side, I joined a volleyball team in town, and, and was <laughs> so you could kind of see a pattern, right? Um, and had fun, had a lot of fun with that too. And um, one of the one of the ladies I played volleyball with was a colleague from my first base, Nathan Air Force Base, and we played on the base basketball team together. So fast forward a few years, and she and her family had um, settled in Colorado Springs. She had a daughter, my daughter's age, and they ended up being in, in preschool together as two-year-olds. I mean, it was just, I mean, the, this is the way the Air Force is. I mean, you continually run into the same people, and it's just a big, big, huge family. And it's, you know, you pick up right where you left off. So we do um, time our, you know, our two years basically at the Air Force Academy. And um, I get promoted in the meantime. And then I'm on, on my way to uh, Air Command and Staff College next, which is my first professional military education um, in the Air Force. Uh, and that's a year long program down at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama, um, which was another um, interesting experience because, you know, Tim and I grew up in the North, you know, and it's different in the South. It's just a different culture. <laughs> and so we, uh, we rented our house from a, um, another military person, sight unseen. We just looked at pictures and said, it's just a year. Looks like a great house, looks like a great neighborhood. That's where we're gonna live. And we, uh, <clears throat> we go there, same, same thing, rinse and repeat on the, the um, uh, daycare for my daughter, right? We found another good program and um, right on the base. And we go um, and we're driving into our neighborhood for the first time ever. And all of the people on the street are outside because it's summertime. All the people are on, on, on the street are outside, you know, working in their yards or whatever, and everybody is waving at us. And we're like, what is the deal? We don't know any of these people. Who are these people? And then I realized, we realized, well, this is the South. This is what people do. <laughs> um, and then, you know, learned more of that over time. Like when you call somebody in the South, you can't just dive into the conversation. You have to have, hey, how you doing? How's your, how's your, how's your husband, wife, you know, kids, you know, Grandma. you have to go through all that, right? And you have to do that at, you have to do that at the grocery store too. You can't like just whiz through and, you know, pick up your groceries. So um, we learned that. We, we learned how to be good Southerners so that by the time we were leaving um, a year later, we were doing the exact same thing. If somebody would drive down our street, you know, we would, we were out there waving too. We were just, you know, we had been, um, you know, um, we were now part of the culture also. So um, 
that was just a year. That was a very quick year. Um, made lots of great friends, all peers. You know, you're going through the course with, you know, um, 300 or so peers of yours, um, all the same grade. And it's basically leadership development, learn a little bit about um, culture and, and history, um, but primarily leadership development. And then from there, um, we moved to, um, uh, where do we go next? We went to Pentagon next. Um, and that was a job that, um, they, that I was interviewed for, and it was one of those very small offices where you're hand selected. and and really a great opportunity, a, a job where I thought there was a great opportunity to use my, my PhD and my training. Um, so, and it was, it was called the Air Force Senior Leader Management Office. And um, same, you know, rinse and repeat again on the same, you know, move, move Emma now at this point she's in kindergarten. So, um, you know, we find a good neighborhood, find a good school, and um, Tim actually did this, Tim, Tim, um, um, basically did a, a trip from Montgomery to um, DC and, and went on a house hunting trip and found us <clears throat> found us what we needed in the in the perfect neighborhood, you know, less you know, walking distance from an elementary school that was a really good elementary school. So we were happy to be in that neighborhood, very easy to get back and forth from the to the Pentagon from where we were. About what year is it? This we're in um, uh, let's see what year, 2003. That's okay. Yeah. I'd added it up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we go to the Pentagon and, um, I take that back, 2002. We go to the Pentagon and um, I'm in the Air Force Senior Leader Management Office and, you know, I, I have, th this is the office that builds, it, that manages all the general officers, all the senior executives, um, <coughs> and all the colonels in the Air Force. So lots of opportunity to dive into how does the senior rank system work? You know, how did these people get here? You know, what are the what are their experiences with once they get here? What are what are the what's the professional development that they get once they arrive at that level? And just had some just had some fantastic um, opportunities to learn in that job about how about the system and how the system works. And then had an opportunity to be part of the development of a new professional development program for the Air Force that um, it, it just, I mean, a, a brand new PhD couldn't have landed in a better spot. Um, and uh, so it was, it was called Developing Aerospace Leaders back then, and now it's just the way, the way we do development in the Air Force. Um, but I will never forget an opportunity that I had to sit across the table, like from me to you, um, with the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force and to pitch my idea on um, force development, a way to develop the force to get to be general officers. How do we develop our next generation of general officers and senior executives? And so I sat there and I, you know, explained the program to him and I said, you know, this is what I would recommend. And he looked at me and he said, let's do it. And I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> and here's your promotion. I didn't. I didn't know what to. I, I mean, I, I, was, I was like, okay, I need to be calm and cool, right? Because I'm sitting across from the chief of staff. Um, but we get out in the hallway, and my boss was a one star. We get out in the hallway, and we're like, both of us, we're like jumping up and down, we're high fiving, you know. Um, so it was just an amazing experience. So not only to sit there and tell him about it, but then to get the opportunity to, you know, start the program and to talk to talk to everybody about how, what we need to change and how we need to change it. And I mean, it was a very large systemic change. And here I am, you know, a major in the United States Air Force. So um, that, was, that was another two years. And in the meantime, so Emma's in, Emma's in kindergarten. Tim is um, working on his own now. He started his own um, business, um, working out of our house. Um, so we're there for two years. And, and over time, um, both Tim and Emma um, would come to me at about the 18 month point and say, okay, what's next? Where are we going? So I, um, you know, they, they have been just incredibly supportive uh, in my career through my entire career. Um, you know, even when it came to making the decision about retirement, uh, you know, Tim said to me, I know how much you love this. So it's your decision, um, and I'm with you, no matter what we do. 
we're, we're here. So, um, so we get ready to move, you know, that's two years we move to the next assignment. And the next assignment is my first opportunity to command. Um, at a, so I, I'm selected for squadron command, I'm promoted again, I'm selected for squadron command. And I'm going to be a um, mission support squadron commander, um, which is basically the office that does all of the, the support type, the, the sir, all of the services on base, morale, welfare, that sort of stuff, the as well as yeah, as well as all the the personnel and and you know we we in process everybody coming in the bay on the base, we out process everybody and all of that sort of stuff. So that was my first opportunity to, to command. And boy, what a learning experience that was, too. Um, I, I had two fantastic first sergeants uh, who, once again, you know, the senior NCO by my side, um, who were just partners in command. Um, you know, we, we both had a role and we both were focused on, you know, having the best organization we possibly could and taking care of the people in our, in our command. And just, I mean, just story after story after story of just amazing experiences with them and um, by, you know, each by, by each other's side, um, you know, helping each other to, to succeed um, in the experience. And, um, you know, I'm never, uh, I will never forget one day um, when the Office of Special Investigation showed up at my um, office. And so, of course, the First Sergeant and I are, are in there and, and um, they sit us down and they said, we've got some, um, we've got some evidence that um, one of your troops is um, involved in, in drugs. And um, and we looked at each other, and I said, "Did you see the the award board when you came in our squadron? Did you walk past that?" And they said, um, "Yeah, we did." And I said, "Well, did you look at it?" And they said, "No, we didn't look at it." I said, "Did you see who our Airman of the Year was? It's the person that you're telling me is it, it's that person." <laughs> That's who you're telling me is dealing drugs. And they said, well, ma'am, we've got a video. And I'm like, oh, gosh. So they show me the video, and I'm just, I am crushed. Just absolutely crushed. And just flabbergasted. I mean, you name the word. I just couldn't believe it. And uh, so they leave. And the first sergeant closes the door, and he obviously sees my distress. And uh, he says, ma'am, he said, I know this seems like a really bad day. But he said it could be 100 times worse. He said, so just, and he said, I can give you examples of that, which I won't do right now, because I know you're not, <laughs> not in a mood to hear it. But he said, it could be so much worse. So. Um, I mean, we, we, I mean, you walk the ball forward. I mean, she ended up in, in jail and, you know, at Coronado, and I ended up going to see her there because um, that's commander's responsibility. And uh, um, she ended up getting out of jail and has recovered well and is a productive member of society with a family and two kids. And she made a mistake. She made a really bad mistake um, that ended up being a crime. And she'll have to live with it for the rest of her life. And, and um, but there's days like that as a commander that you know that's why you're there. You know you're there to, um, of course, keep good order and discipline, but also to take care of people because even when people screw up, they need help and they need to, they need somebody to take care of them. So um, th that was just a. a just a superb experience as a as a squadron commander, and then the experiences, you know, with the relationships built with the other squadron commanders. You know, as a female, um, um, there was another female um, squadron commander who was in the maintenance um, squadron, one of the maintenance squadrons, and then there was another one, actually, um, the first ever female fighter 
um, squadron commander on my base, um, who is now a congressman in, um, in Arizona, congresswoman. So um, just really cool experience um, to be able to, to be a peer of hers and to try to help her do her job, um, and, you know, because she was the first. And that was a, that was a, a challenge um, for her being the first. So um, that at that point, um, it, as I mentioned, Tim still had his um, Tim still had his business, and when we were in Arizona, that was Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and Emma was in elementary school at the time. Um, once again, exposed to another culture, um, uh, being in Arizona. Um, they had to close down the campus one day because there was a mountain lion on the campus. <laughs> they just, I mean, just, I laugh about it because it's just something that, you know, the kid in Virginia or in upstate New York doesn't think about. That, you know, there could be a mountain lion roaming through the campus. Um, so we just, we really enjoyed Arizona. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Didn't think we would because driving across the country, you know, it, it started to get really bleak and there was nothing there. And we were like, where are we going? But we um, learned to really enjoy the fact that there was something always blooming in the desert and there were all sorts of new animals in our backyard that we didn't know what they were. <laughs> so it was a great learning experience for, for my daughter as well. Did you deploy? We d I did not deploy. Wow, I never did not, whole it, Which is unbelievable in 26 years. So I was on the verge twice of deploying. Uh, once very early in my career um, as a lieutenant, um, and it was pulled at the last minute. And this would have been during Desert Storm? Desert Shoot? Storm. Desert Storm, okay. Yeah. Um, and um, so that was the first time. And then the second time it was as a squadron commander. Um, once again, orders in hand, ready to go. Um, and my group commander, pulled me in and said, four out of six of our squadron commanders are deploying. And he said, we have to operate home station. We've got to make sure everything at home station continues with no interruptions. And he said, your job is to deploy people. I mean, that was part of our job in the, in the mission support squadron. He said, I'm really sorry, but he said, I'm pulling your orders. He said, you've got to stay. I can't lose another squadron commander, and I can't lose a squadron commander that is in charge of deployments. I mean, I can't do it. So there was a, I, I don't know why. There, there was a reason both of those times um, why those things happened. Um, and I look back, and part of me says, boy, I, I feel like I missed out. Um, but at the end of the day, um, at the t all of my jobs along the way were to make sure that the deployment process was spit spot, basically, to make sure people came and went, and and I, you know, over time saw my role as I'm I'm in support of those people going downrange and doing what they need to do, and then um, you know getting them um, you know back into their families and. Um, which is not easy. Um, you know, we used to think that that was easy. We just go and then you come back and you step back into the family and it's all good. And it's not. So over time, that was my job. That was my job from the day I was a squadron commander in 2002 through the time when I was a um, wing commander. My job was to safely deploy people and make sure they had all the tools and techniques and everything they needed to deploy and then to welcome them back and incorporate them back into their families. So that was, that was my contribution to all of the war efforts that were going on during my time um, when I served. I can say that that is such an important job. I deployed to Iraq and um, was stationed in Baghdad where, where that was a central location to come and go. And being that um, person, I somehow got myself from the 
from the mechanics uh, to logistics. And so when people would get off the plane or bus or um, whatever they were traveling on, I would be there smiling, no matter what it just happened that day or the fact that it was 152 degrees. Um, but that makes such a difference mm -hmm. when somebody cares when you arrive and when you leave because you're scared, right, when you're coming and you're relieved but scared when you're going back. So it's good to know that somebody was on the other side yeah. smiling at them also. And that, that, so what you did was a great service, I'm sure, that people still remember and talk about. Okay, I just want to. Well, I hope so. I, I, um, you know, I took that job very seriously, and as a commander, you know, um, sent off every troop, you know, even, even if I had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to put them on a bus to get them to where they were going, um, and shook every hand and, uh, you know, hugged every spouse because I just thought that was really important. I thought the troop needed to know that, hey, we're, we're here, we're behind you, let us know what you need, and we're, we're going to be taking care of your family while you're gone. And when you get back, we cannot wait for you to get back, but do your job, and when you get back, we're going to welcome you back, and we're going to have another party and, and um, get you back into everyday, you know, everyday operations on the base and in your family. That makes so. a real big difference. Thank you so much Thanks. for that, even though in different branches. But <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Um, so you said you were a wing commander? Yeah, so that's how I finished my career. Tell um, me about that. At um, Wright-Patterson. And, um, you know, as you, when you start out as a second lieutenant, you don't think, you know, boy, I can do that job. You know, at least I never did. I, um, you know, as I slowly moved up um, in the ranks, I saw what the next level was, and I thought, boy, I think I want to do that. I think I want to do that. So I remember sitting at the table as a squadron commander watching my group commander saying, I think I want to do that someday, you know? And then when I was a group commander, same thing, sitting, looking at the wing commander, saying, I think I want to do that. So, um, you know, you, you get selected. The Air Force selects you. And uh, so I was selected to be a wing commander. They asked me where I wanted to go. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter where you want to go because at that point, the Air Force says, here's where you're going. And, um, and I was lucky enough to be assigned to Wright-Patterson again and, and um, you know who would know that we would come back to my husband's hometown to to serve again um, and you know as you know I went through the process and sitting at the end of the table um, in charge of a, a wing of 5,000 people supporting a base of 29,000 people you know you you can't help but think boy how did I get here <laughs> You know, <clears throat> it's a great time of reflection to think back and think about, you know, all the, experience that, uh, the experiences that I've had over time have built to this point of me sitting here and doing this job. And, and once again, it was all about, you know, being in a position to get people the tools and, and techniques and equipment that they needed to do their jobs and to do them the best that they could. And, um, and then to, um, you know, s celebrate you know, celebrate success with people as they, as they do well and, and, you know, put your arm around them when things aren't going so well and encourage. Um, and, you know, I, I, it, I just, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that job. It was just a, it was just a fantastic experience, both from a perspective of leading the organization on base and in helping to make the base run as efficiently as it could, because that's what that job is all about. You know, everything from security to communications to the hospital. I mean, everything that everybody relies on, on that installation every single day. Um, and then, you know, all of, you know, you're the face of, of the wing as well. So all of the off-base relationships and building relationships with, with the local cities and the, the local mayors and city managers and, and the community in general. I mean, the, the base is very important to this community. Um, so building those relationships as two relationships as part of the job was was very important as well, and and a part that I I found that I really loved, um, and um, and and you know probably where I, why I ended up where I am today um, because of those relationships and how much I loved it and how much I loved the community. So um, just you know looking looking back, I mean it just it. Being in a position like that, you know, makes you immediately reflect on, um, you know, all the lessons you've learned um, 
you know, in the last 26 years, um, which, you know, many people don't take an opportunity enough, I think, to reflect and to, to think about things like that. So. How long were you a wing commander? For two years. Just two years? Yeah, it's a really quick, I mean, most command tours are, same thing when I was a group commander at um, Royal Air Force Lake and Heath. I, um, it was two years. And it was a very, very quick two years, very busy, um, you know, because you've got all your off-base responsibilities and all your on-base responsibilities. Um, but just a, a, um, just a fantastic um, leadership um, experience. Okay. Um, so after Arizona, where did you go? Yeah. So um, after Arizona, uh, went back to school again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, like the Air Force, you know, the Air Force either, uh, you know, thought, knew I really enjoyed school or they just thought I wasn't getting it. I don't know, one of one the two. Um, so, um, go back to school um, to the Industrial College and Armed Forces at National Defense University and um, study um, basically the industrial complex um, for a year of the Air Force. Um, which was a great experience, really enjoyed it. Um, and once again, opportunity to connect with peers, and not just peers from, from the Air Force, but peers from all of the services, so across the board. So it was fun learning about their experiences and their services as well. Um, and then um, from there, got an assignment to, um, <laughs> this was kind of funny because we, I had interviewed for a job in the Office of Secretary of Defense and we, um, so I'm thinking we're going to the Pentagon again, which was no, was was great because we already we were in D.C. going to school, so that's an easy. Don't have to move the family again. My daughter can stay in the same school, and um, and this comes the days the day to get our orders. And the, um, the the Air Force liaison hands me my orders, and they say Stuttgart, Germany. And I was just so shocked. That I, I thought I was never going to go overseas because just because of the career field I was in, and um, so I uh, I called my husband immediately and I said, Tim, where's Stuttgart? <laughs> Which of course we still laugh about to this day, but um, so he looked it up. He knew he he didn't have to look it up. Um, but we we went off to Stuttgart, Germany, and spent two years in southern Germany. Um, and my daughter was of the age, she was a middle schooler, so she was the, of the age where she remembers everything. Um, every weekend we had, we were out traveling somewhere. We took as many trips and saw as many countries as we possibly could. Um, even went to Tunisia, N never a place that I would have selected to go, but I thought, we have an opportunity, why not, let's go. Um, so we, um, we had a wonderful, wonderful time. We were getting ready to close out the tour there in um, November of 2009. And uh, <laughs> we uh, say, well, let's go to London. We haven't been to London yet, so let's spend a weekend in London. So Thanksgiving weekend, we get on an airplane and we go to London. And we see a bunch of shows and we just have a fantastic time. We head back to Stuttgart. And um, my commander comes in and says, Cassie, here's, here's your next set of orders. Congratulations. We're going to RAF Lake and Heath, just north of London, <laughs> for our next assignment. I was like, great, now we, now we know London, right? So we had head up to, to England from 2009 to 2011 and had the chance to be um, a commander again at the mission support group. And another just fantastic experience, a lot of great relationships. Um, and it's an operational mission, F-15s on the flight line. So just, a, you know, go, go, go um, sort of assignment. Continually deploying people um, and, um, and welcoming people back. And um, that's where I had an experience that, once again, uh, you know, there's experiences every so often that you just will never forget. And as I mentioned, I um, said goodbye to every airman leaving. And um, one morning, I'm out saying goodbye to a group of airmen, five o'clock in the morning, they're getting on a bus to go down to Heathrow to get on an airplane. So I meet a brand new airplane, or a brand new airman from um, our security forces squadron and his 12 best friends for the next few months as they're getting ready to deploy together. 
and say, meet all the spouses. And this one airman was brand new, so he had just PCS'd in, um, permanent change of station, to RAF Lake and Heath. And um, so I got to meet him, got to meet his spouse and their, their young child, um, and put him on the bus. And, you know, take care of each other, guys. We'll see you in a few months. And um, later that morning, I'm in the doctor's office for a doctor's appointment. Never answer my phone typically when I'm with the doctor, um, but that morning I did, and I'm really glad that I did because it was um, um, March 2nd of 2011, which is a date that I'll never forget um, because it was the day of the Frankfurt shooting, and um, my airman flew from Heathrow to Frankfurt and um, got on an Air Force blue bus to go over to um, Air Force Transport to go downrange. And um, somebody got on the bus and started shooting. And uh, um, the driver of the bus immediately died, and then one of my airmen um, was shot and immediately died. And, um, and we had several that were injured um, that day. And, and then one of my airmen got up and I'm getting the chills while I'm talking about this, but got up and challenged the shooter and with, without a gun, with nothing. He just got up and challenged him. And uh, he, um, the gun uh, malfunctioned while it was pointed at his face. So he, he took, he's a smart kid, took the opportunity, grabbed the gun, and the shooter started to run. Well, he chased him, chased him through the Frankfurt airport and eventually got some um, police to follow him, and they apprehended the shooter and caught him. And, um, you know, obviously, fast forward, he was charged, and he's in jail for a really long time. But in the meantime, we lost two airmen that day, and um, one of the airmen was, was one of the ones I said goodbye to, and it happened to be that brand new airman that morning. So um, the call that I got when I was in the doctor's office was from that airman who had apprehended the, um, the shooter and he called me and he said, ma'am, he said, uh, here we are, you know, we got, you know, two wounded, um, you know, two KIA, you know, what do I do? And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, we're, I'm like getting a call from the battle zone, right? And, um, you know, the only thing I could think of was take everybody's phone, <laughs> get everybody's phone, you know, calm out right now. Um, because we got to get control of this, and I've got to get to spouses before CNN does. Um, so walked into, you know, fast forward, not, lo not long, but fast forward to um, going to visit with the spouse, and um, house was full of boxes. They hadn't even really emptied boxes. They didn't have a TV, thank God, because they hadn't moved in yet, so they didn't have anything connected. Um, so sat down with her, and before, before we went, we opened up her personnel record and we, his personnel record to make sure we were bringing the right kind of chaplain with us. And we had a medic with us, of course, it's the typical team. And um, we, um, we brought a Mormon um, chaplain with us that was really hard to find. That person was really hard to find in England, but we found one. Um, and we found him quickly and he jumped right on board and went with us. And he wasn't a chaplain, he was from the local community. Um, so he wasn't military. Um, anyway, he went with us and we, um, we gave her the news and she looked at me and I'll never forget these words. She looked at me and she said, um, he wasn't even where the bad guys were. And I just, I, what was the answer to that question? I, I mean, I just said, I know. I, I mean, you're right. Um, of course, the world has changed since then, and the bad guys are can be anywhere. Um, so we wrapped our arms around her and around her family and two little ones, and and um, you know did a big memorial service in a hangar. I mean, it was packed full. The the our, our commander from um, USAFE uh, came up to the United States Armed Forces and um, Air Forces in Europe came came up um, to the ceremony, and just we we. We really honored him um, very well, um, 
and then it got her eventually back to the United States and got her settled. And, but just an experience from being a command. I mean, you just don't get an experience like like that every day, where you could really support your um, your troops and your um, um, you know your organization. So um, anyway, that was a that was an experience that I had in um, in England that I just will never forget. That is something. Thank you for sharing that. After England, how many more times did you PCS? Yeah, so sorry, two more times. I, I one quick trip to Colorado Springs again to Peterson Air Force Base for a year, and then to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Where you retired? Where we retired, and and um, you know didn't did not plan on retiring in the beginning at Wright Patterson, but um, we had spent about a year, and then we thought, okay, well the time's coming, so we better start thinking about are we moving or not? What are we going to do? And um, so I sat down with my husband and my daughter, and my daughter was getting ready to be a senior in high school. Um, and my husband's parents were at the point where they needed some help um, medically. They were having some health issues. And um, we just said, you know what? We're at the right time, at the right place, and this is an amazing community. So this is, this is the time. And throughout my career, I'd always, my husband and I had always talked about, one day it's going to be your turn, <laughs> um, you know, because my husband always put himself, you know, tucked in right behind me, um, supporting me, which of course I really appreciated, and, and um, that he kind of gave up his, his career for mine. Um, so it was, it was time. It was time for him to, to have, his, have his career and to, to really be able to thrive in what he wanted to do. So... Um, he was able to get a really nice, nice position here. My daughter was able to finish her senior year in the same high school. Um, and we were able to be here at a really critical time for my mother-in-law and father-in-law. And, and um, literally right after we retired, she was diagnosed um, with um, mild cognitive impairment and then um, passed four years later um, of Alzheimer's disease. And we were here. We were, we were here to, to support his family and um, you you just can't um, you can't do that from afar you just can't do that from another place so um, that was just a real blessing I think that that um, you know everything happens for a reason um, and that was just a real blessing in our life that we were able to to be here for all of those important moments um, in our lives that is so good okay um, what message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear or view this interview? Um, boy, that's a, you know, I think, I think the biggest one is um, find your dream and go after it. Um, and do that while being true to yourself. Uh, don't try to be somebody else. Um, and then remember to pave the way uh, for those behind you because there's, there's people that are trying to figure out where the pathways are. And um, I think everybody needs to, you know, it's, it's our job in life to help that next generation and to help them figure out where their pathways are. And we can't forget that because, you know, they're going to pick up where we left off and, and do amazing things. Um, with the next generation and so we need to prepare them for that and we need to help them get there. Okay. So I think that's what I would say. Okay, great. Um, that concludes our interview with Cassie Barlow. Thank you for your time today and for your military service. Thank you very much for your time too. You're welcome. This and thank you for your service. Oh no, I'm not important. <laughs> <laughs> yes you are. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, wait, no, turn it back on. So let's talk about what you do now. <laughs> um, so what I do now is a um, extension, really, of what I've done for the last 26 years. So, um, so in the military, I was in a, um, I was in human resources, and in I was a commander for many years, and during that time. 
I spent a lot of time focusing on um, building pathways and on the next generation and on building the people around me and on helping them to achieve their goals. And um, so it just seemed like a natural um, extension for me when I, when I um, retired to step into workforce development. So today I work for a company called the Southwestern Ohio Council for Higher Ed. And um, we help um, students um, through internships try to discern uh, what they want to do for their careers. Um, so we work with companies around the area um, and organizations on base and off base to um, create internships um, so that students can, can try um, different occupational options uh, before making, a, making their choice on what they want to do for the rest of their lives. Do, <coughs> are these students coming out of college or high school or both or, and where do you find them? Yeah, so it goes all the way from juniors and seniors in high school all the way up to postdoctorate level students. And we don't really have to look far to find them because our um, SOCHI is a consortium of 23 universities across the region. Um, so without, you know, we have a natural connection with all of those students um, through their university. But um, what I have found is since being in this job is that students search far and wide for internships and students love internships. Um, because they really uh, are hungry to try to figure out what it is that is, you know, is going to be right for them. So um, during the summer, um, we recruit students from all over the country. Uh, and students apply from all over the country to come to little old Dayton, Ohio for an internship. So it's really exciting, actually, to be able to, to be kind of in the middle of all of that. What is the percentage of kids that apply that get internships? Is, yeah. is that quantifiable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's not big enough. Okay. It's not big enough. Um, I am of the belief that we can never have enough internships. Um, and um, that it's our duty, once again, um, across you know every company you can imagine, no matter how big, to host an intern. Um, and if you're a small company, maybe that's just one intern. And if you're a larger company, maybe it's 50 or 60. But um, I think every company has an opportunity for an intern, and it's just a matter of, you know, our role, too, is working with those companies to help them understand that um, they have a really cool opportunity that they don't even realize uh, for an intern to come in and help them. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great research on there that, out there that tells you, tells companies why interns are so important. Um, you know, internships are a great way to try out um, new employees. Um, they, they increase retention rates in your company because interns tend to stay longer than employees that weren't interns. Um, and they inspire your thinkers within your organization. So there's all sorts of great reasons to hire interns and to make them part of your team. Um, and then, you know, goes without saying that you're building your next generation workforce because the, what the research says is almost 70% of those students get job offers. So that means that they're doing a good job and that companies like them. That's, that's awesome. So I know that can't be the only thing that you do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tell me about your, your baseball yeah. team or your basketball, <laughs> volleyball. What else do yeah. you do? Especially yeah. with Emma being, is she yeah, out she's of college? In college okay. So she's getting ready to graduate. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I remember sitting at our, my daughter's last basketball game because we, when she was in high school, we were at games pretty much every night or something for her school. And um, so we were sitting at the last game and I remember s talking to my husband on the drive home, just like, this is so depressing. What are we gonna do now, you know? <laughs> and looking back on that, it was kind of a funny conversation because, you know, the, the schedule definitely has filled in. Um, and, you know, I, I really enjoy my board, um, the, the board service the many boards that I serve on across the community. I really, really enjoy that. I've learned so much about the community. I've learned so much about um, nonprofit organizations and how they run and how to run a good organization. Um, and I just love being a, a community member who gives back. I mean, I, I think that um, 
you know, there are so many, there are so many needs across our community um, for volunteers. And, um, you know, the, the more people that, that give of their time, the better our community is. So I, I really enjoy being involved in um, many different boards. Um, and then, of course, I teach part-time, too, um, I, because I love to teach. So I'm an adjunct professor as well. Um, so I get to have fun in the classroom also. Okay. Uh, you, can you tell me specifically about a nonprofit you're attached to, or is that not allowed? Yeah, no, I think I can. I, um, so I guess I would choose the, the one, I mean, there's so many to talk about, but I think I would choose the, um, the Girl Scouts, Girl Scouts of Western Ohio. So, um, you know, I, was a, I wasn't a Girl Scout as a young lady. I, um, it just wasn't an opportunity where I, where I lived. Um, and, um, but, you know, the day my daughter as a, you know, little kindergartner brought home that flyer from school, um, I was in. Um, <laughs> and she was in. So she was a Girl Scout literally her entire life. She still is. She's a lifetime Girl Scout. She went through all the ranks and did her gold award and um, couldn't be more proud of, of everything that she's done um, in, her, in, in her Girl Scouting career and above and beyond that as well. But so I, you know, I was along with her for the ride and just really enjoyed it and ended up being a Girl Scout leader, ended up being a cookie mom, took you know, 20 girls to, um, to Pisa, Italy at one point and just had a fantastic time um, that I never imagined I would have done. And um, so when all of that, you know, when my daughter graduated, she finished her gold award, um, the Girl Scouts of Western Ohio approached me and said, hey, you know, would you like to still be involved? And, and the Girl Scouts is the best um, organization in the world for building uh, women leaders. The I best. I agree. Um, if you look at all the CEOs, women CEOs, if you look at the women in Congress um, and in the Senate, I mean, a huge percentage of them were Girl Scouts. Um, and the research, the research is, is strong. The research indicates exactly what I just said, that, that we know how to build young ladies, um, young lady leaders. Um, so it's just a real honor to be on that board uh, and I am the vice chair of the board now, um, and I'll be the, the chairperson next year um, for two years. And I just, I mean, there's so many uh, wonderful things going on in um, Girl Scouting that um, are just really right for our girls um, and for, for building our young ladies. And considering, you know, women are now more than 50% of the population and more than 60% of college graduates, um, we need to focus on women. We need to focus on building that next generation of women and um, getting them into those senior leader roles in organizations. Because if we leave women behind, we're leaving, we're leaving a huge portion of the population and we're missing out. And we're missing out on those, on those leaders. So it, that's, that's one of the boards and one of the ones that I, I really enjoy. Do you get to go to Camp Reef? So um, I get to go to some of the camps. I don't get to participate as a girl, unfortunately, but I get to go and um, you know enjoy through through them. I get to live vicariously through them and watching them and and talking to them. And we did a really cool thing last year um, with Girl Scout West, Girl Scouts of Western Ohio. We did a a Girl Scout Air Camp. So Air Camp is a is another one of my boards. And it's a um, organization that's here in um, Dayton that um, basically, you know, trains young children from um, elementary school, middle school, um, on um, you know, being a becoming a becoming a pilot, becoming a leader in the STEM world. And the culmination of the camp of the week long camp is they actually get to fly in an airplane in a Cessna. They act, they're flying it. They're not flying in the airplane. They are flying it with a certified um, instructor. And so we did last year the first ever um, Girl Scout Air Camp. And what we're trying to do is, you know, put that on steroids so it's not just girls from Dayton who are going to that camp, but it's girls literally from all over the world that are going to come to Dayton, kind of like they go to Houston for, um, or Huntsville, I'm sorry, for, um, 
um, space camp. Same thing. Um, they're going to come to Dayton, Ohio to go to air camp. Um, and it's going to be a specific program just focused on girls. So the, the camp is actually um, takes place out at one of the Girl Scout camps. So they get the same experience, same Girl Scout experience, Girl Scout camp experience as all the other girls, but added on to that is the air camp experience. So just a really neat opportunity. And to see that graduation, uh, I got to, to be the guest speaker last year at the first graduation, and to see that graduation and all the young ladies come across the stage with their flight suits on and their patches and just so proud of what they accomplished and um, what they were able to do and to, to be able to be the first class ever of Girl Scout um, air camp, air campers was just really exciting. That, that is super great. I just, I can't think of a great, a good <laughs> adjective right now. It's just, that's, that's amazing. Um, is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or that you would like to mention? I don't think so. I think we talked for a really long time. <laughs> we, ha we have talked. I think talked. I've told you all my stories. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I can't think of anything. I, I just thank you for doing what you're doing. What you're doing. Um, I know it takes a lot of time and energy. So so thank you because I think um, you know especially our our veterans, our older veterans. It's really important to capture those stories um, for posterity. So we can capture that history because it means more coming out of, um, you know, as a first, as a, um, you know, coming out of the source um, than it does reading it in a history book. That is super true. And I love this. And I have really enjoyed meeting you and having you sit down with me. So thank you so much. Thank you.